So I really hope that you guys are not in too much of a post-lunch stupor because I'm going to be talking to you now about how you can drive some real results and deliver on your objectives using a first-person marketing approach. So this morning, we've heard some really great theory. We've heard from Rusty about the importance of customer context, about delivering on your customer expectations at those moments that really matter. And we've heard from Susie and Sophia about the importance of establishing trust with your customers and about generating uh, engagement, long-term engagement and a long-term relationship with your customers. And we've also heard some incredible and fantastic client case studies in the base camps. And of course, at Adestra, we bring all of this under the umbrella of first-person marketing, which is all about um, increasingly utilizing all of that really valuable data that you can harness from your customers. So profile data, preferences, um, previous purchases from you, and also the, probably the most important is your customer's behavior. So that those real-time indications that they are in the market for making a purchase or engaging with your brand. So what they're doing on your website <clears throat> and what campaigns they are opening and clicking on. So I, I think we all realize that personalization and first-person marketing done the right way really delivers results. It delivers engagement, but that also translates into conversions and revenue or what, whatever your, obje your organizational objective is. But despite this, the reality, uh, according to the email, the e-consultancy email census, is that the, the vast majority of us are only in the early stages of implementing personalization across our email program. So why is this? What's getting in the way? Well, of course, there are lots and lots of challenges, and these are the, the types of challenges that marketers report in this order. So obviously, integrating data, I mean, that's a massive one. I'm sure all of us have different pots of data that exist on different systems, and it's not always easy to get those systems talking to each other and getting that data in the right place where you can use it to personalize your campaigns. And I talk to marketers all of the time about how they're really struggling to find time away from their day-to-day -day in order to work on their strategy and develop those more advanced campaigns and programs. But I think out of this list, for me, number three is absolutely key. Because if you don't know where it is that you want to focus and you don't know what it is that you actually want to do, then how do you really know what data it is that you need and what data is most important to you? And how can you then make a case for freeing up time and resource to deliver on that plan? But again, you know, we're working at a time when there are lots of shiny new technologies and loads of different tactics and tools that we can use to enhance our email marketing. And it can be incredibly overwhelming. I mean, how do you know where to start and where to focus your efforts and what's actually going to generate the, the best results for your business? So I think um, Susie talked about this earlier, but it's really, really important to remember that these are just tools and tactics. They're not an end in themselves, and it's definitely not a tick box exercise. So, what it doesn't replace is having um, a really solid core communication strategy that is based on customer insight, your understanding of your customers' needs and wants and the way their life cycle and the way that they engage with your brand. And it's likely that this uh, core strategy will include broadcast campaigns because they are still important, some segmented and targeted campaigns, and also life cycle journeys and um, event triggered campaigns. So, 
Um, what I'm going to talk to you today is um, about some tips, my five top tips to help you develop your plan and then follow it through to execution. So I'm going to talk around these five points and I'm going to illustrate my points with um, some more case studies to really bring it to life. So firstly, the importance of actually understanding where you are now, the current state of your email marketing, and also the importance of understanding where you are now and where it is that you want to be. So at Adestra, we have identified eight core pillars that underpin success in our email and digital marketing. So some of us, how many people here have heard of the eight pillars before? Oh, quite a few of you. That's good. Um, so we've got maybe the obvious ones like segmentation and personalization, automation, which we, we talk a lot about. But there's also things like reporting and customer intelligence. So how do you use that your campaign reporting and other insights into your customer behavior in order to uh, inform your strategy? And testing and optimization, this often gets overlooked. Um, but you know, this can provide small incremental gains that really add up over time. Data optimization and list growth, you know, incredibly important. And digital design and build, what, how your campaigns are designed to generate more engagement and your processes for actually getting those campaigns out of the door. Um, and we've gone one step further. We've taken those eight pillars and we've developed a sophistication scale, or you might have come across similar uh, maturity models. But what it does is allows you to assess how you're doing in each of these different areas and to identify perhaps areas that are neglected, but also areas of opportunity for your business that will allow you to really take your email marketing program up to the next level. So we are now in the process of trialing the model with, um, with quite a few of our clients, and we've had um, really positive feedback so far. So if you're interested in going through this process, then please do talk to your account manager because you know, we'd love to work with you and help you to identify those big areas of focus and opportunity for you. So I've got a really nice... Uh, Oh, no, I'm sorry, I've gone in the wrong order. But <laughs> what is also important and what is also really useful from doing that kind of assessment and audit is to understand how you're performing now, but also where it is that you want to be. And we've designed our sophistication scale to allow you to see what the next level looks like and to create um, a picture and a, and a plan for where it is that you want to be. And this is really, really important because it gives you something to focus on. It will help to motivate you and your team. And it will also help you to communicate that vision to your wider business and win buy-in and support where you need it. So I've got a great case study to talk about to illustrate this point. So um, the stage, anyone, anyone heard of the stage here? They are the must-read publication if you work in the performing arts. And they've been around since 1880, a really long time. And of course, now they're online. And they've also diversified into a whole load of um, complementary products. So things like they've got a jobs board, a casting service. They run industry awards. And they've even got a dating site for people who are interested in the theater. So as you can imagine, with all these different products, uh, they have a lot of different pots of data. And when they took a look an honest look at the way that they were working, they realized that having these different pots of data separately and having to take data and manually process it and then upload it into Adestra was just incredibly time consuming. It wasn't GDPR compliant. And moreover, it was holding them back from doing more sophisticated things with their email marketing. So they worked with Adestra, they worked with our technical team in order to set up um, a series of uh, overnight 
exports and imports going directly into Adestra from their different internal and external systems. And what they effectively created was a single customer view within Adestra. So this has been really transformative for them because they have the data where they need it, they can run filters, they can segment, and they can target their campaigns, particularly their advertiser-sponsored campaigns, which has been very commercially successful for them. Another area of focus for them was actually um, creating their campaigns and getting them out the door. Now, again, this was a real pain point for them. The templates were difficult to use, and they didn't always render well um, across different devices. So again, they worked with our digital design team to create a modular template solution, which allowed them to very quickly create a campaign by selecting the different modules that they needed and populating content. And they knew that it would render well and look great across all the different devices. And um, so again, you know, this was a real game changer for them. It allowed them to respond really quickly when breaking news happens, which it does in the theatre industry as, as in any industry. Um, and overall, across both those things, by optimising their data flows and putting the um, modular template in place, they were able to save five hours per week across a team of two. So as you can imagine, that's incredibly valuable time that they've been able to put into uh, to developing their strategy, to sending more campaigns, and also to automate some of their key lifecycle journeys for new subscribers to the publication, and also a nurture program for prospects who have hit their article limit on the website to help nurture them to convert to a subscription. So really great results for the stage. I'm just going to have a glass of water now. Um, but my point number three from my five tips is to take your big goals and to break them down into everyday achievable goals. So if you want to develop an email strategy that is really going to deliver on your business objectives, then it makes sense to start with whatever that big objective is, whether it's commercial or you may have a different goal, <coughs> depending on your organisation. But say, um, for example, that this email team has been tasked with growing revenue from the email channel by 15% in 12 months. That's quite a tall order. Anyone got a similar objective? Yeah, a few of you there. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, we need to think about where is this email revenue going to come from? So is it going to come from our existing customer base or from acquiring new customers? So both of those are absolutely valid and you would look to develop um, you know, both of those areas. Um, but for the purposes of this exercise, I'm going to develop um, a strategy around existing customers. So at that point, you can think about different customer segments, different life cycle stages and different behaviors that you want to encourage. So this might include things. So for this, obviously, you need to do your analysis. You need to understand how your customer base breaks down and how people are behaving. But what I co commonly come across in retail is that um, many clients have a large uh, segment of customers who have only bought once from them. And they want to encourage those customers to make that all important second purchase that will take them on the journey to becoming a loyal and, and regular customer. Uh, also, you might want to increase the frequency of purchase. You might want to increase the amount that people are spending each time they transact with you. And you may have a big pot of lapsed customers who you want to win back. So from that point, you can actually think about, you know, what are the actual tactics and initiatives I'm going to put in place in order to develop these different groups. So you might want a single to multi-buyer automated program. You might want to put in place uh, minimum spend offers by the different segments to try and nudge people into spending just that little bit more. And once, once you've got these, these ideas and these plans, then you can work on prioritizing them. So you want to prioritize based on which of these projects you think will have the most impact on your ultimate goal. And you can also take into account 
you know, what are your quick wins? Which things are quite easy to implement? You can get them done quickly and then start seeing a return from them. So you can begin to do your prioritization based on quick wins, things for, for longer term consideration. So I've got a great case study from blinds to go which Rusty talked about earlier. Um, they're one of our North American clients and they haven't been on board for that long, but they've done a tremendous amount of work in quite a short time. So when they came to us, they had some big issues around email. They knew that they were getting pretty poor inbox placement. Um, emails were not performing very well. They had low opens and low clicks. And they knew that there was a, quite a large proportion of, of the database who just hadn't opened an email for a really long time. They just emotionally unsubscribed. And they knew this was because they were just doing batch and blast. They were sending the same emails to everybody. So they needed to tackle this, and they needed to tackle it fast in order to protect their sender reputation. But of course, they, actually, they wanted to do it in a way that would protect and grow their email revenue. So what they did was some analysis of their emailable base. And what they identified was that, um, so you can see here, I've got email engagement along the bottom, very active over here, and purchases up the um, vertical axis. But what they uh, recognized was people who were over here, this actually doesn't take into account recency of purchase, which was a big factor for them as well. Um, but people over here who are actively opening and clicking and may have made a recent purchase, these are people who are likely to be in the middle of a redecoration project or a renovation project. And they saw that this is where their next purchases were most likely to come from. So they were really confident about increasing frequency in these areas, and their objective was to move people on to that next action, whether that was ordering fabric swatches, or ordering a catalogue, or going into one of their stores. And they created uh, life cycle, life cycle programmes around these events, um, <clears throat> which would nurture them through the process. Because as Rusty said, it's actually, I've bought a blind online, it's actually quite an involved process because you have to measure it just right and then you get very nervous in case your blind is going to arrive the wrong size and not fit. Um, so they take people through that process. And they also identified that people over here who were inactive, they hadn't opened an email in a really long time, they still wanted to email those people because they wanted to keep the brand front of mind for the next time that they might have a need for um, a blind or window dressing. So um, they emailed them less frequency, frequently, but they did a lot of testing around subject lines and pre-headers and content in order to generate the best open rate and the most engagement to move people over in that direction. So what kind of results did they see with this strategy? Well, a really big impact. I think this was just over about uh, six months. Susie worked very closely with them actually on this project. Um, and they saw a massive 53% increase in revenue per email, which, um, as you can imagine, they were really, really pleased with, and they sorted out those deliverability problems completely. So if you can see here, I'm actually picking out the different um, pillars that were of particular areas of focus in these case studies. So my point number four from my list of five is the importance of getting buy-in. So sometimes in an organization, we might be working really, really hard on email, but we feel a bit isolated. We're not talking to the rest of the business about what we're doing. But if you want to achieve big things in any business, then it is really important to get buy-in from both your senior team and other teams within the organization. So you should be ready to communicate your vision and to put together a business case which will justify what it is that you want to do and predict what kind of impact and results that you're going to get from it. And case studies can be really useful in doing this, ROI models, etc. And we often work with our clients um, on business cases to secure budget for projects, etc. Um, but what's also important is actually collaborating with other teams who also impact on the customer experience. So things like your website team, your customer service team, uh, maybe your in-store uh, people and marketers, 
It's really, really important to, in order to create a joined up experience for your customers, an integrated experience, to, um, to really ensure that the content and the messaging are consistent across those channels. So to illustrate this point, I've got a great case study from Direct Wines. So this is quite timely as we approach Black Friday. Uh, this is all about their Black Friday campaign last year. So historically, they'd done pretty well on Black Friday, but they felt that they could do even better by doing an integrated campaign across channels and um, also by leveraging the full Black Friday week, so increasing the number of campaigns that they were sending. So to achieve this, they put together a cross-functional team and they started planning as early as April. So they involved um, their catalogue team, their print team, there was uh, direct mail included in the campaign, and they also coordinated this with their inbound and outbound telemarketing. And what kind of, uh, also, they uh, personalised the content um, within their email campaigns based on people's wine preferences and their previous purchases and the type of uh, subscription that they had. And they had phenomenal results. They, um, they were so overwhelmed with orders that their warehouse had to get more stock in. Um, it was unprecedented demand. And when they looked at it, when they calculated how well it had gone afterwards, they saw three times revenue growth compared to the previous year. So all round success, and that was achieved by coordinating across those channels and across their teams. Cool, so just to sum up, back to my five points. Understand your current situation, do, do that analysis, See, use the Adestra eight pillars if you can, work with us on that to understand how you're performing and where those areas of opportunity are for your business. And, oh, I did them in the wrong order actually, but make sure you get buy-in from your wider organization and make sure you break down the big goals into achievable goals and then take the time to prioritize what you're doing by what will have the most impact. And the last one, this is the one I call the Wagamama approach. And I think Susie referred to it earlier and, and Rusty as well. So don't wait for everything to be perfect because it will never be perfect. What you need to do is like Wagamama do, get it out there when it's ready. And then you can start generating results from it and see a return. And you can also learn from how it's performing and you can build and iterate and test and optimize. So that's it from me, and thank you very much.